Doctors with disabilities exist in small but measurable numbers. How did they navigate their journey? What were the challenges? What are the benefits to patients and to their peers? What can we learn from their experiences? My name is Lisa Meeks, and I'm thrilled to bring you the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Join me as I interview docs, nurses, psychologists, OTs, PTs, pharmacists, dentists, and the list goes on. I'll also be interviewing the researchers and policymakers that ensure medicine remains an equal opportunity profession. Hi, everyone. Today we celebrate World Poetry Day, March 21st. This day was established by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, in 1999 to promote the importance of poetry as a form of cultural expression and linguistic diversity. The aim is to celebrate the unique ability of poetry to capture the creative spirit of the human mind. In today's episode, we're unveiling a collaborative poem crafted by two UK physicians with disabilities. Through their verses, they share personal insights and address concerns about disability inclusion in a way that hits home. The poem serves as a critique, shedding light on the gap between the language used by medical associations and the real experiences of disabled healthcare professionals. As the host, I was genuinely moved by the poem, struck by its authenticity. It prompted a meaningful discussion about challenging existing narratives and navigating the complexities of disability in the medical field. Our guests emphasize the importance of community and resisting the pressure to conform to predefined professional molds. The episode wraps up with a hopeful note and a call to action. Our guest voices resonate with the power of authenticity and the potential for positive change. It underscores the importance of not just listening, but truly valuing and acting upon the voices of disabled individuals. I hope today's poem inspires you to take meaningful action and to perhaps connect with the poet inside of you. Now, let's listen or read along as our guests introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Megan. Megan Brown, my pronouns are she, they. I'm a senior research associate in medical education at Newcastle University in the UK. I am multiply disabled. I have a growing collection of completely fabulous walking sticks, if I do say so myself. I am a poet as well, slightly amateur one, but no one can say that I'm not keen. And I'm very interested in qualitative research, creative methods of expression, and research relating to the experiences of disabled healthcare professionals and using that to try and change practice, support, and systems. And I'm really excited to be on this podcast. I'm a little nervous. I tend to go a bit blank when people ask me about myself, but hopefully that was okay and hopefully not today. But thanks, Lisa. I'm really excited to be here with Joe and maybe I'll hand over to them now. Hello, everybody. Uh, My name is uh, Joe Hartland. My pronouns are they, them. I trained as a medic and then left the NHS in 2018. So my work now is primarily at the University of Bristol, uh, where I'm the deputy education director for the medical school and a senior lecturer. And my focus is on about how we teach health inequity within curriculums and how we bring in the voices of marginalized people into our healthcare spaces. In addition to that, I am a queer health activist and in the UK, I'm helping to lead a campaign uh, which seeks to try to get medical schools to support a ban on so-called LGBTQ plus conversion therapy in the UK. I am somebody who has lived with a disability for a long time, both physical and mental, but it's only been in the last 
probably 18 months or so, maybe even a year that I've started to think about the word disabled and how it applies to me. My problems have always centered around mobility and hips and arthritis in my hips. And so I've often used the term mobility issues rather than using the word disabled. So I guess for me, this is quite important because coming on here and talking about it, writing a poem with Megan about this has kind of helped me embrace the power of that word and to not feel perhaps a level of shame that I felt before around it. I am a huge fan of both of you. I'm excited to hear the poem that you have co-created for this space and then to share it with our audience. And of course, this is a preview in some ways of an upcoming UK special series where we will dive in deep with both of you on your personal stories. But for today, you've created some art to share with the world. And I have not viewed this art. I have not heard this art. So I am especially excited today to both consume it and then to talk to you afterwards about questions that come up. So with that, I'll let you begin. Unwelcomed and devalued. We help each organisation. I am unwilling, made different. With the statutory. By virtue of a diagnosis. With the reasonable. Assigned a mask. With the law. A mandatory shell. We do not forget our remit. I must find the energy. We know that reaching beyond. I must find the time. Disrupts service and... To show less of me and more of you. Weakens productivity. Paying tax with my dignity. Lacking compassion? Never. Am I your odd penny? We believe the differently abled. That somehow slipped your net. If they are lucky, hold value. Misshapen, spinning. And may free their betters of burdens. A currency you can spend. You know what we mean. Don't you see what you take from us? We must be reasonable. There is nothing reasonable about this. Our standards must be maintained. Welcome and valued. We must all bear the weight of competence. Fighting to survive. We have looked at the law. Your keepers cannot stop me. We hear you and understand. I know who I am. Equality means treating everyone the same. I am joy. I am strength. And there is no one more equal than us. I am mine to define. Wow. I, I honestly don't have any words. I'm sure people from the UK probably um, have a recognition of where the title comes from. For anyone not in, in the UK, what Megan and I hope to do with this was to, to essentially, and I'll let Megan talk about the actual theory of this, but to, to, to use poetry to critique the General Medical Council's document, uh, Welcome and Valued, which is meant to outline their responsibilities for disabled doctors in the UK and disabled students in the UK. And our thoughts on whether that document really is fit for purpose. Wow, that was powerful. This is a commentary on the facade of medical education in the UK and the association's responses to attempting to to communicate to individuals with disabilities that they are welcomed and that they are valued. 
but you in this poem deconstruct the language in a way that is so interesting to me. I feel like the subtext of the stated meaning is where you're at. So you have taken the introduction and you've translated it into the emotional feeling that an individual with a disability has versus the words that are said and the intended meaning of the word. It feels as though you've said these are lovely words that don't have the meaning and the strength behind them that are needed. I wasn't anticipating tearing up, but it is so powerful because we do it in the United States as well. We have these reports from the AMA, from the AAMC, and all of the right words are said, and they're all nicely placed and rearranged and, and signed off on. And yet what you've done is show how fragile those words really are without the actions and meanings behind them. You can be disabled, but not too disabled. We want you to disclose, but don't challenge us and don't complain. We want to uplift you and talk about how inclusive we are, put you on a website, a poster, as long as you're not too sick. Megan, do you want to just give a bit of background? Because, I mean, like I enjoy poetry and I've written poetry in the past, but Megan, this is far more your thing. Do, did you want to talk a little bit about how we approached it? Don't undersell yourself, Joe. It was it was really amazing working with you. And I, I that is exactly what we were hoping to do, Lisa. So it's really reassuring to hear you say that it's looking in depth at that language. And we tried, as Joe has said, to take that more critical approach, this critical poetic inquiry of this this huge document and to try and unpick those dominant ideas to explore power in the document and we took quite a flexible approach to it but we read and read that document over and over again and actually the first few times I read it it was just this kind of like corporate word salad almost this kind of legal jargon everywhere at one point I was a bit like I don't know how we're going to make a poem out of this it's so legal how do I put statutory in a poem in a way that has any emotion behind it but there, there are some quotes from doctors in this document. And I think there are eight quotes in total throughout this 110-page document from doctors. And the rest is this legal terminology and jargon and advice for organizations. So what we really wanted to play on was this contrast. And we felt that when we read the document, we felt that the doctor's voices were tagged on a little bit or kind of stuck in there, not meaningfully integrated into the document and the recommendations that it made. And so that's why we had these two voices in the poem, the organizational voice that was performed by Joe, um, and then the voice of the doctors. And to be honest, there were so few quotes from the doctors. We did find ourselves bring our own experience into the into the doctor's voices, both I should have said as well, I'm a, an ex-doctor having left clinical practice. And I, and I don't think it's a coincidence that, that both myself and Joe are in that situation and, and sort of bringing those experiences and trying to bring that critical lens to this document and saying we are, we are disabled doctors who this hasn't worked for. And so that's what we, we were trying to do with, with unpicking the language. And we try to bring as much language from the document as we could into the poem. So a lot of these phrases, when we unpick them, have come directly from welcome and valued itself um, or there'll be a kind of key word that we've honed in on and try to um, play around with a bit to kind of get to that underlying meaning and try, and try and problematize some of the framings you know some like you said some of this is lovely language possibly in isolation but also we felt a lot of the way that disability was framed in this document was problematic. There's a big emphasis on productivity. You know, you're welcome and valued if you're meeting these competency standards and, right, like who defines those and and what does strict adherence to those mean, essentially. I think 
if if we've the time going through it line by line or at least picking out some of those key words that, that we brought in might be interesting. Joe, I'm really I've been talking long enough. I'm not sure if there's anything that you want to add to that sort of process of how we created the poem. No, I, I think the only thing was that kind of as we processed it and we identified sort of themes that stood out to us. Each stanza represents a theme. So we had themes of the priority of needs for an organization, a theme of productivity, a theme around legality and about how disability is defined and how individuals define it for themselves. Competence was a theme and this idea that we had to maintain excellence on the assumption it would fall if disabled doctors were allowed to work. Responsibility, definitely definitely working from like a deficit perspective of like it's the disabled doctor's responsibility to make up for their perceived deficit, not the environment that should be accommodating their individual needs. And then this idea of gatekeeping and how successful it feels that you can be as a doctor. I mean, as we go through the poem in a second, there's a couple quotes in there that are just, just really, really sad. But it was a really interesting process and I really enjoyed writing it. Megan had written the structure originally and was like, oh, I've had a go at writing from the organization perspective. And then I kind of read it and was like, that's just Megan. Like, <laughs> I can only hear Megan within this poem. And so I had to have a go at like doing it. And I think I was a little alarmed how easy it was for me as someone who's maybe involved in policy with the Medical Schools Council and with universities and stuff, how easy it was for me to fall into policy language and how easy it was for me to take on the identity of an organization. And then when we decided who read, the reason that I read the organization lines was also because I'm genderqueer, I will present my gender anywhere from sort of verging on masculinity to femininity and and everywhere in between. That's what makes me feel happy and comfortable. Um, But I'm aware that I can assume male privilege very easily. And that like hearing my voice, people will hear male, that'll be what they'll be coded for. So me reading the organization line was deliberately made to draw on the patriarchy, to draw on the structures of power and oppression that oversee and entangle with this concept of disability. So that it's not just about the fact that you're disabled, it's also about the fact that you're disabled and a woman or from a global majority and everything else in between. So you know, my whiteness, perceived masculinity and everything else comes into the voice of the organization, which I think is really integral to kind of the concept. It's it's interesting as a author of a association document on disability, I I was feeling this, I think, differently. As I was listening, I was I was prepared to take notes, to to find some themes, to ask me questions, and I found myself unable to write after the first few lines, just the gravity of what you were doing and the importance of the contrast was just hitting me like a ton of bricks. I think I was reacting to how powerful your poem is and at the same time reacting to this feeling of having been one of the authors on one of these documents and thinking, wow, I need to reflect on what we've created and and what do we need to do to kind of wrap around these reports and say, okay, but there are more layers. There's more that we need to address. I wonder if it might make sense because it's the, each stanza kind of tells half of the story. So the first one is, so we help each organization. I am unwilling, made different. With the statutory. By virtue of a diagnosis. With the reasonable. Assigned a mask. With the law. A mandatory shell. Lisa, as you identified that drew very much on the introduction of the document Mm. outlining kind of the remit like you were saying Megan use of the word statutory in a poem felt a little bit weird but it's it's also really important because uh there is something poetic in the way that language can be used and manipulated in order to 
depersonalize and at times dehumanize or certainly it wasn't the intention of the authors of this document to do that i do think sometimes there is a dehumanization when we look at the way that the language is used and that's actually remarkably easy when you start thinking about policy and organization and like the responsibility and so i think what we tried to do within this first paragraph was contrast the organization's language with what was being forced onto the doctor we, we went back and forth on the line mask quite well, it was, it was um, mostly my accent when it came to mask <laughs> but mask and masking it, it came through to us quite strongly and I and I think that is influenced by our own personal experiences of having both been doctors who have become disabled and felt the pressure to do that I mean, personally, I you know, we could see language in this document that we felt would pressure people, that word assign. We went back and forward on what was the the right word, but we wanted to make it clear that it wasn't always a choice. That there was a pressure and there was a power for you to assume this mask of competence, of productivity, of being of value and of benefit. There's even, there's one quote in the document, and I think it's in the section where disabled doctors are describing the benefits they bring to the profession. It's not, that's not quite the right language, but in their own words, which, you know, in some ways is kind of, it's kind of gross anyway, isn't it? Like, why should you have to justify what you're bringing to the profession to, to, to be part of that profession? But th- there's a quote from a doctor, with, it's framed positively in terms of they're describing how themselves and their team adjusted to their disability. And it's kind of along the lines of the, the team found administrative tasks for the disabled doctors to do whilst the team went and did other jobs such as ward rounds and this is framed positively and when I read that I felt so sad but also in the, in the lines of that's that's framed as being something great and as being a positive accommodation and, and adaptation whereas actually you know that's a very restricted role that, that that doctor has been assigned and it was that kind of idea that forced to put a positive spin on it isn't this great isn't the overly grateful for what is given to you when when what is given to you is is not right or is not actually what you need to thrive i think this portion in in particular will be so powerful to our audience because i don't think there's a learner out there that hasn't felt compelled to fake it or mask or get by while this is written for disabled individuals it applies to those that might be in a more transitory state of depression or anxiety it, within medical training. I think the same types of documents, the same types of policies that are meant to provide some sense of safety to the learner are often following the same cadence of this these disabled documents. It's okay. We're we're so glad you're here. We want to, you know, make sure that you feel included. And at the same time, don't be too sick. Don't be too depressed. And and I think that's that opening line that that Joe read. If we help each organization and we just got such a strong sense that this document is for organizations it's not for disabled doctors it's not for disabled mm-hmm. learners it's not you know whose benefit who is the document serving and again it's back to that question of power of you know who has authored this is it really co-produced with disabled doctors if you just shove a few quotes in there Mm-mm. Um, it's not and what does meaningful co-production of policy look like I, that's a big question, right? That's a huge question. I don't have an answer to that question, but I think it's important and I don't think we do that enough. I'm guilty of talking about the benefits of disabled physicians because it's it's an easy in, right? The non-disabled majority want to know why we should consider this in a sea of applicants who may not have disabilities? Why should we even entertain this conversation? And Duncan, our our friend, is constantly challenging me on this. And I've now adopted, because of these conversations, a, a, a different perspective of, yet these may be additional 
valuable contributions from this population, but they should not have to prove their worth above what every applicant does. And that is a new way of thinking for me. And we see that in the, um, you know, the arguments around like the, the good migrant, right? Like that uh, often you see these arguments for immigration because they, at least in the UK, you know, we've got a terrible uh, culture of making uh, immigrants uh, and asylum seekers feel unwelcomed. Part of the UK structure is to make them feel like that. And you know, often one of the things that people say is, oh, but, you know, this person came and they were an undocumented migrant at the time, but now their their son is a doctor in the NHS. And like, you know, this and that. And it's like, well, but no, they're just people and they deserve opportunity and equal access to society as everyone does. Like, we are not required to justify our existence and our right to exist in spaces simply based on the concept of capitalism and productivity, right? We don't have to be producing more than everybody else simply because we make you uncomfortable being there. Your discomfort does not require me to to in some way change the way that I behave, perceive, produce, whatever. And I think you see that across all intersected marginalised identities, whether that's to do with... Uh, race and ethnicity to me as a queer person the, the, the idea of sort of acceptability politics and, and trying to make yourself presentable to people don't cause problems I don't have a problem with gay people as long as they don't push it in my face as long as they're quiet as long as they get married and they do the right thing so yeah for me that's that's one of those important messages I think is around the idea that we don't have to just meet additional standards to be allowed to exist and and have access to spaces that are made inaccessible. They don't have to be inaccessible. They are made inaccessible. The career structures are made inaccessible. The exams are made inaccessible. And if they are made inaccessible, they can be made to be accessible. discussed this quite a lot in relation to the the poem joe i'm just remembering our conversations around inspiration tropes i'm i mask quite heavily when i'm around anyone <laughs> and come across as a kind of very bubbly person I, and i shared some of we started this process by trying to share a bit of our own poetry with each other and i sent joe some poems and i don't want to speak for you joe but I, you, you seem kind of shocked when i shared yeah. with, maybe that's an, a reflection of unmasked me and i'm just like a really dark person inside i also think that part of disability and and you know there's no one disabled experience and i love that poems can unpack how that is different but part of my experience is pain is i live with chronic pain and you know, I think it, poems have that power to play with language, but but you, you you go beyond it. It takes you beyond, like you said, what is there on the page, beyond the actual language to, can I make the reader uncomfortable? I, I don't want to write those inspirational poems. And I think it's, as Joe said, it's also kind of critique that narrative of overcoming that we have in society where disabled people are warriors and they're heroes for being disabled. And it's a trope. It's an oversimplification is unrealistic. You know, I'm never going to recover from my medical condition to the extent where I'm going to be climbing mountains with m my walking stick. I don't want to do that anyway. You know, I don't know if I can use the term inspiration porn on here, but that's the term that a lot of us will be familiar with from Stella Young. And it objectifies disabled people at the end of the day. And it's coming back to the point that Joe made earlier about that kind of dehumanization. And we wanted to be careful to avoid that with this poem. But equally, I mean, when we get to the last stand, we try to be a little bit more uplifting than my own personal um, dark experiences of poetry that I shared with, with Joe at the beginning of this process. <laughs> Should we go on to the next one? Okay, we do not forget our remit. I must find the energy. We know that reaching beyond. I must find the time. Disrupts service and. To show less of me and more of you. Weakens productivity. Paying tax with my dignity. 
this was some of this came from that very early poem that I wrote that was really in my voice that first attempt and we had to kind of rebalance it with I find it a bit more challenging to write from an organizational perspective but probably because I've been burned by policies like this myself so part of that reflexivity was that discussion and rebalancing but yeah I think so kind of finding the time and the energy and and time was something that was really important to me I'm very interested in the theory of crypt time and how kind of normative understandings of time for disabled people actually you know it's different time is experienced differently it's not linear there's an additional burden I think you know we've called it tax in the poem on time um, but also on, on dignity and effort and again it comes back to the conversations we've already had around masking productivity being forced to prove that productivity if not go above and beyond to perform that it's a performance isn't it that the masking and that does require a huge amount of effort so yeah that's what I think from the the early poem that I wrote to to try and bring in some of that lived experience too I really wanted this to ask to try and link to some of the theories out there as well when we were kind of writing the Mm. poem so it didn't just stand alone as its own piece of critique and so we we kind of had that last line paying tax with my dignity I mean in the next stanza we'll we'll read in a second we go into more to do with value what value means and and how that's placed and within that sentence we kind of changed it up a little bit so that it reflected you know the idea of like minority tax and the idea of how we can struggle to sometimes feel like we need to pay an additional fee in order to participate in order to be able to to not be seen as the problem you know what are we actually required to give away in order to do the job of a doctor like I've certainly felt that from a queer perspective around what parts of myself have to be hidden in order for me to be deemed professional and so I think that was kind of as we go into the next stanza when we start talking about value that was kind of where we were sitting with that yeah let's go ahead and go into the next part uh lacking compassion never Am I your odd penny? We believe the differently abled. That somehow slipped your net. If they are lucky, hold value. Misshapen, spinning. And may free their betters of burdens. A currency you can spend. I think this is when I started just tearing up. (laughs) Can we talk about your choice to use the term differently abled and were you intentionally being provocative? Yeah, I think that was me. I I can't remember quite what your your kind of cultural language in America around disability is. I just organized teaching for our year ones at Bristol Medical School. And we'd had some disabled people come in who were speaking about their experiences. And we gave a context to the UK disabled people's movement as part of that lecture. And so there was a lot of talk around around holding the term disabled and being a disabled person, finding pride in disability. And one of our speakers said how patronizing they find the term differently abled. Me too. Uh, like, don't, don't contextualize me in the context of y- you, like the abled. Um, like, I am disabled. And the majority of my disability comes from society and the way in which my body that fits outside of society's norms does therefore not fit into society's expectations and buildings and everything else that comes with it so yeah differently abled was like a deliberately patronizing (laughs) choice of language yeah so for those in the audience listening that might not have picked up on that it i would say for people with disabilities for the most part the use of these terms to avoid saying disability might make you feel better as a non-disabled person. It doesn't make us feel better. It does feel patronizing. It feels othering. It feels more othering to me than to use the term disability. I don't know about for both of you. Yeah, it's it's not a dirty word, is it? Like disabled is not a dirty word, just 
say it it's not that hard to say it it shouldn't be that hard to say it and I think as Joe said it was trying to get at that the stress on value and and what the organization saw as being valuable within that which I think is is super important there's a whole discussion around that language and the and the appropriate language to use but yeah it was a it was an intentional choice you know hopefully it's got this conversation going hasn't it the other thing that you say that just almost like I have a visceral reaction to it but free the betters of the burden that is so thematic of where my work is right now in the U.S. in the U.S different than the UK. People go to undergraduate education, then they head to medical school for four years, then they go into postgraduate training or residency. And the conversations in residency, we just finished a qualitative study, were thematically tied to this idea of unfair burden to the non-disabled trainees to house and train with and and welcome a trainee with a disability, that it would be a burden to others. So tell me more about that line. I think that comes from what Megan was quoting earlier around the, in the document itself has the example of the doctor who was taking on the administrative tasks for their colleagues. You know, there's there's a lot of conversation, especially in UK training, about the degree of uh, of administrative tasks that that doctors have to do as part of their job. I think for us, it stood out that it was it was almost like this kind of institutional gaslighting, like somebody was being told that you have a place as long as you can free up the rest of your team to go and do real medicine yeah Um, absolutely the actual like snippet of the quote that we used was freed other colleagues to gain more complex clinical experience without an administrative burden so that is where the word burden came from in the poem the whole discussion around the burden to other team members and taking burden away from them to, to prove value you're almost like sweetening the deal like if I do this for you will you allow me to exist in this space absolutely and Megan I want to circle back to to another thing that I think is a layer that belongs in in this conversation but something that you spoke to earlier which is you, you said people who know you know you you've put on this mask as you describe it and you're very jolly and cheery and happy and you are all of those things by the way the the thing that that strikes me is really interesting is also the personality mask the the personality compensation in this space i have had so many disabled physicians say, I'm super nice to everyone, go above and beyond so that people don't feel burdened having to work with me. I can't imagine the cognitive energy, the emotional energy to have to show up as the happy, jolly, perfect, nothing bothers me person in a workspace. I, I've I've seen and heard and experienced that as well, Lisa. And I think also in a in a research space for for my myself that now being where I work. But I think in particular, I have problems setting those boundaries because it's always like, how can I prove myself valuable or in you know invaluable, indispensable in this space, knowing that to say for example to apply for a job and to ask for it to be remote because I have I use a walking stick and travel and 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 getting into the office and and things like that can be more difficult for me it feels like an additional ask and an, an additional request that could be held against you so I think I definitely feel that and if that comes through in the poem that's probably also because that's yeah that is my experience of be super nice don't rock the boat and that makes it really difficult to 
critique and to advocate. And I think it's only now that I'm in a position where I've left the medical profession. You know, the GMC doesn't have a regulatory power over me now um, because I gave up my license to practice and I'm not in bed with them in that same way. I still depend on them for some research funding. So, I mean, there's, there's a little bit of a risk there. <laughs> And actually, they've just funded a research project that will be about disabled doctors' experiences. So that's positive. But still, um, yeah, a position of lesser power. And I think only now that I have that distance, am I able to look and think more critically and not be as nice? Because I've always felt the pressure to be just super nice. And I still feel that now. So if I'm never not nice to you, it's probably a compliment. <laughs> so I'm unmasked <laughs> In, in some sort of twisted way, if I mean to you, it's a compliment. <laughs> There's an important intersection there as well, though, because I think, although I do experience that, again, carrying through the conversation of whiteness and the conversation of, of, of perceived masculinity, I think we've seen the similar conversations around, like, women and feminine people in the workplace as having to try to soften their language when they're critiquing a, a male colleague and you know come across as ridiculously polite and I, I do myself find that since coming out uh, that that is increasingly becoming more common for me but I think there is also that that intersection and you know I, I work with the GMC in different areas and I, I, I'm known to be very vocally critical but I think that's probably there is a privilege aspect to that in the fact that I'm able to be vocally critical, not just because I've left training, but also because it's harder for them to push back against perceived masculinity and against whiteness and so on because of the privileges that come with those identities, which is inherently wrong. Megan, I don't want to be speaking for you, but I think this interacts with the idea of not just you as 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 a disabled person, but also you as someone who's disabled and feminine presenting as well. Uh, it, those things can be really quite powerfully contracted on top of each other. For sure, yeah. There's a strong socialisation to apologise for your existence if you're feminine presenting, isn't there? Just uh, so sorry to bother you. I think that's a really fair point, Joe. as well. We know in from the research literature and from what people have told us and been very vocal about is that that experience is worse for black women for example who feel like they have to really moderate that how they're presenting to people in terms of just you know being called aggressive for just interacting with people which is which is totally wrong obviously but yes I think there's a real intersectional piece and an important component to that and something for us to consider because obviously we've we've written this poem joe and i are both we have there are lots of intersectional identities layered within that but we're both white so i think there's you know we have to consider also what is missing in the poem i know we're, we're very proud of it um but we are speaking from a particular voice and so i think that's an important consideration as as well it just needs to be it needs to be taken into account and caveated it, this is a critical lens from the position of our identities and our experiences. You know what we mean. Don't you see what you take from us? We must be reasonable. There is nothing reasonable about this. Our standards must be maintained. Welcome and valued. We must all bear the weight of competence. Fighting to survive. I think what's really interesting about this stanza is this is the only time Megan's voice um, uses like a kind of a plural as in like a group. So don't you see what you take from us? Um, up until then, the contrast of the two voices has been very much the community, the organisation, us versus the individual, Megan in this case, that, that her voice or their voice and the experience within that. So it's interesting here we decided to kind of pull in the idea of a disabled community. Yeah, we had some conversations around whether we should stick with it being organisational versus individual throughout, but we were... Uh, 
I again I can't speak for you Joe or you Lisa but that found such community through disability and actually love being part of the disabled community myself so we thought it was important to also reflect that within within the poem and also the other word that I would just pick up on in this stanza um, from the doctor's perspective is fighting and this again comes from a direct quote of a doctor who was speaking about fighting with their deanery, with with their organisation to secure any sort of accommodations to their working environment and to their practice. And that that word is there in the language, but it's also, as we've spoken about, echoed in, echoed in the structure of the poem. The whole poem is a conflict, is a fight. We wanted to try and pull out those moments of tension between the organisation and the individual. And that came from the reading of that quote from, from the doctor in this document about their fight with their organisation to just get what they needed to to do their job to exist and so fighting would be the other word that I would just pick out from from that stanza I think that's common throughout the world any any group that we've talked to or done research with this constant need to to fight for what you need or to going back to the previous stanza to be very appreciative for what you get and figure out how to compensate for the rest. A hundred percent. And it kind of links into so the, the organizational word, I think that's interesting here. So I've been doing some work with the Medical Schools Council recently and the General Medical Council as well on reasonable adjustments in exams for disabled undergraduates and spent a session with representatives from medical schools who kept sort of bringing examples of, of things that students needed in order to be able to participate in placement, be able to participate in, in uh, exams. And they kept saying, that's not reasonable, is it? And, I was, and my response just to them kept being like, isn't it? Like, is it not reasonable <laughs> for you to do? And it was sort of became a running joke by the end of the session that every time someone said to me, you know, that's not reasonable, that I would just push it back and be like, why? Why is it not reasonable? Because that's how the Equality Act in the UK works. It talks about the idea of reasonable adjustments. You know, you don't have to make an adjustment as an employer or an, organ- or an organization if it's deemed to be unreasonable. But I think we have to be really clear what unreasonable means. Reasonable legally and within law, like within the Equality Act, does not just mean difficult. <laughs> like it has to be really, really, really unreasonable to do. And we use the same language here in our laws that protect individuals with disabilities. So I think that will resonate really strongly with our audience and who decides what's reasonable and how much of that decision is impacted by being uninformed about the potential for accommodation, having bias and ableism deeply embedded in your decision process, not exploring possibilities. I think there's so much untapped potential for accommodation or modification that goes unexplored. A hundred percent. And I mean, we've spoken about this before, but this idea of of benevolent ableism and how that plays out. And I see that a lot with like the reasonable conversations. So like this idea that, oh, we shouldn't make this accommodation for them. We can, we can do it. But it's not really reasonable because they're not going to be able to get that when they start working in the NHS. So certainly in the undergraduate degree. Keep explaining to people that as, as, you know, educational providers, it's not our job to plan out the shortcomings of their future employer. It's our job to make sure that they can have their opportunities to uh, flourish and succeed and that we can reasonably accommodate those needs. That idea of reasonable does not include pre sort of considering what their potential future is. But that's been a really interesting conversation kind of within the last six months that seems to be very prevalent in, in the UK discourse around this at the moment. Should we do our final stanza? Yeah, we're nearly there. <laughs> um, so we have looked at the law. Your keepers cannot stop me. We hear you and understand. I know who I am. Equality means treating everyone the same. I am joy. I am strength. And there is no one more equal than us. I am mine to define. 
Tell me about the, the choice of words there, Megan. I have to admit that a lot of this stanza came from Joe, so they may be better placed to speak about some of this. As as we've discussed, I, I tend to lean into the, the morbid rather than the uplifting. <laughs> but I I mean, for, for me, when I, when I read that and when I feel it, it, it speaks to the conversations that we've had around language, around identifying as disabled rather than differently abled. I, again, back into that conversation around masking and around being told this is what a good doctor is. This is what professional looks like. And actually having autonomy, having the autonomy as a disabled person to assume that that, that role of a doctor in a, in a more authentic way. So to me, that's what that final line speaks of we we did hope that it would end on a slightly more positive note than some of the rest of the of the poem has been because there is disabled resistance and disabled people persevering in the in the face of these requirements and these barriers and these environments that are that are not designed in a in an accessible way for for many different types of people that is incredible uh, and you know you don't I don't want to lean into that into the inspiration tropes but it is a big lift. And I think that that does require us to kind of bear witness to. And that's what we were trying to do in this final stanza. Joe, I don't know if there's anything you want to add, given that a lot of that came from you. I think for this, I kind of say my work in queer health and kind of queer health activism and in the teaching of queer health um, or, or LGBTQ plus health within curriculums, one of the things that I reflected on for a long time, especially for for trans people in particular, was that um, we always teach about these communities from a place of trauma. It's always that Mm -hmm. they have these terrible health outcomes, they have these terrible burden of mental health problems, they have this, they have that. And we never really talk about like, the, the joy in those communities, the success, the love, the celebration. And so, you know, we use case-based learning at Bristol and so often one of the things that I try and get people to do when they're writing cases for these populations is to say like do you have to write this in a way that disempowers that individual that adds moralism or can we write this like from a place of joy can we give them a loving relationship can we give them can we empower them can we give them career can we give them these things like how do we how do we frame our conversations and I guess I wanted us to end the poem on the idea of disabled people's joy, not from this idea of inspiration, but from the fact that they and we deserve access to spaces and success and love and careers and that we should have access to joy. And that within that, it does take a lot of strength for disabled people to do that. The last two lines for the organization, I always wonder if I got a little bit too like, sassy with them at this point but uh, equality means treating everyone the same and there is no one more equal than us for me was just speaking about people's misconceptions about how equality works and and what it means is for an organization to um to give opportunities to people and the idea that oh we just uh, treat everyone the same does not level any playing field it just reinforces the systems of oppression absolutely I can't wait to see you both this summer. And thank you so much for doing this. It was lovely. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for having us. This episode was not just a conversation. It was a testament to the resilience and advocacy of the disabled community. It serves as a reminder that when policies and documents signal progress, there is still so much work to be done to ensure that these words translate into meaningful support and inclusion. Join us next time as we continue to explore the critical issues in our upcoming UK special series, where we'll dive deeper into Megan and Joe's personal stories and the broader context of disability and medical education. If you like this episode, share it with a friend and be sure to subscribe to our podcast for the latest stories from the Docs with Disabilities team. This podcast is a production of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative and is supported in part by the University of Michigan Medical School Department of Family Medicine and Disability Program. 
the Stanford Medicine Alliance for Disability Inclusion and Equity, and the Ford Foundation. The opinions on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, their respective institutions, or the funders. This podcast is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Non-Derivative License. This episode was produced by Gabe Abrams, Lisa Meeks, and Jacob Feeman.